have some fear here. Here, look at that. So kefir is fermented milk. It's very similar to yogurt. Wow, yeah, you can see it's quite thick. Yeah, kefir. Um, it's very similar to yogurt, but it's a slightly different symbiotic community that forms it. And um, I'm going to read you this essay from this book, Slanted Truths, by Lynn Margulis and Dorian Sagan, called From Kefir to Death. And they have some interesting things to say about kefir. Um, but before we go into what they have to say about kefir, I, I kind of want to just, just like experience the kefir a little bit, because, uh, video. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I'm getting to the dregs. Um, so that's an interesting difference between kefir and yogurt, is that kefir has dregs. And the reason why it has dregs is because the community of bacteria and yeast that live in the kefir form little, um, little selves, little, little pustules of of, uh, of associations um, and so they ferment the milk that they're in but they in doing so they build these hybrid bodies um, whereas in, with yogurt yogurt is exclusively exclusively bacterial and so there isn't a chance to build these sort of like fungal yeasty bodies in the yogurt so the yogurt is like more homogenous whereas kefir is fermented milk and then kefir grains. Um, so that's that's the, the physical difference between them. So kefir just makes you a lot more acutely aware that the food that you're eating is alive. So you're like, oh, whoa. Like, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like those little pustules here you can see. See that? See that like little curd? Come on. Don't focus on me, camera. There we go. The curd there um, is alive. It's a scoby. It's a symbiotic community of bacteria and yeast. Um, yeah, so kefir really reminds you that your food is alive because you can taste it. It's like a little sandy. Um, <laughs> I'm not selling this 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 food very hard am I know but it's wonderful it's like uh, I've, I've been drinking this all day <laughs> it's really great um, it's very nutritious and full of probiotics and now I'm just rambling I've been talking at you for for three and a half minutes I'm gonna get to Lynn Margulis now because Lynn Margulis has more articulate things to say on this matter than I do <laughs> and then maybe maybe in a future video after I've read this one I can tell you what I think about it a little bit more articulately than mm, kefir is sandy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's let's do that. So, from kefir to death, by Lynn Margulis. So, read one more set first. Okay. It happens to the individual. Death is the arrest of the self-maintaining processes we call metabolism. The sensation, the, sensa the cessation, the ending, in a given being of the incessant chemical reassurances of life. Death, signaling the disintegration and dispersal of the former individual, was not present at the origin of life. That's a claim. Unlike humans, not all organisms age and die at the end of a regular interval. The aging and dying process itself evolved, and we now have an inkling of when and where. Aging and dying first appeared in certain of our microbial ancestors, small swimmers, members of a huge group called protocysts. Some two billion years ago, these ancestors evolved both sex by fertilization and death on cue. 
Not animals, not plants, not even fungi, nor bacteria. Proteists form a diverse, if obscure, group of aquatic beings, most of which can be seen only through a microscope. Familiar protists incur, include amoeba, euglena, ciliates, diatoms, red seeds, and all other alga, slime molds, and water molds. Unfamiliar protists have strange names, foraminifera, heliozoa, Iliobaspids, Eli, Elo, no, <laughs> Heliozoa, Elobiopsids, Elobiopsids, Foraminifera, Heliozoa, Elobiopsids, Xenophyophores, Xenophyophores, <laughs> Xenophyophores, <laughs> an estimated 250,000 species exist most of which have been studied hardly at all. Death is the loss of the individual's clear boundaries. In death, the self dissolves. But life in a different form goes on, as the fungi and bacteria... Ah. But life goes on in different forms, as the fungi and bacteria of decay or as a child, or as a grandchild who continues living, the self becomes more abundant because of the disintegration of its metabolo me metabolic processes, but metabolism itself is not lost. Let's, let's repeat that. Death is the loss of the individual's clear boundaries. In death, the self dissolves. But life in a different form goes on as the fungi and bacteria of decay, or as a child or a grandchild who continues living, the self becomes moribund because of the disintegration of its metabolic processes, but metabolism itself is not lost. Any organism ceases to exist because of circumstances beyond its control. The ambience becomes too hot, too cold, too dry for too long. A vicious predator attacks or poison gas abounds. Food disappears or and starvation sets in. The causes of death in photosynthetic bacteria, algae, and plants include too little light, lack of nitrogen, or scarcity of phosphorus. But death also occurs in fine weather, independently of direct environmental action. This built-in death... Hold on. Hold on. Let's, let's go back. I was hoping she was going to explain something, but she didn't, so I'm going to explain it, or focus on it. The self becomes moribund because of the disintegration of its metabolic processes, but metabolism itself is not lost. So, I die, a mushroom eats me. My metabolism ceases, and in so doing, the fungi's metabolism expands. So there's an unbroken line of continuity of metabolism. Now what's metabolism? Well, it's, it's the functioning of life, right? In the broadest of senses, it's just capturing energy and using it to continue form. That's metabolism. So my form ends, my particular form, I die, I'm consumed by a fungus, but the metabolism, the energetics, continues on. Or I die, but my daughter lives on, right? My metabolism is continuous with hers. We're not talking about genetic similarity, that's far too sophisticated for this, we're just talking energetics. So what she's saying is that there is a core kind of self, a self that is underneath the individual selfhood, right? The first sentence of this paper was, it happens to the quote, individual. So what she's saying is that there is a kind of selfhood, metabolism itself is not lost. There's a kind of selfhood underneath each of our individualities and well, she doesn't go on from that. That's just what she says. She says that there's a kind of selfhood underneath our individualities. I would go on to say that when we comprehend that 
lower level selfhood, right? Or maybe it's a higher level selfhood. What does as above, so below. When we recognize that deeper continuity of self, that is a recognition of the divine. Right? That's the claim that I want to make from all of that. But now I've gone way far away from these slanted truths. Um, so I'm going to continue on. The causes of death in photosynthetic bacteria, algae, and plants include too little light, lack of nitrogen, or scarcity of phosphorus. But death also occurs in fine weather, independent of direct environmental action. This built-in death, for example, Indian corn stalks that die at the end of the season, and healthy elephants that succumb at the end of a century. This is programmed. Programmed death is the process by which microscopic protocysts, such as plasmodium, the malarial parasite, or a slime mold mass, dry up and die. Death happens, as they say, say death happens, say, a butterfly. Hmm. Death happens as, say, a butterfly or a lily flower made of many cells matures and then disintegrates in the normal course of development. Death happens as, say, a butterfly or a lily flower made of many cells matures and then disintegrates in the normal course of development. Programmed death occurs on many levels. Monthly, the uterine lining of menstruating women sheds its dead cells, the menstrual blood. Um, sorry. Monthly, the uterine lining of menstruating women sheds as its dead cells, the menstrual blood flow through the vagina. Each autumn, in judicious trees and shrubs of the northern temperate zone, rows of cells at the base of each leaf stem die. With, without, the de with, without the death of this thin layer, cued by the shortening of day length, no leaf would fall. Using genetic engineering techniques, investigators, such as my colleague at the University of Massachusetts, Professor Lawrence Swartz, can put certain death genes into laboratory-grown cells that are not programmed to die. The flask full... Hmm. I've not read this before, so it's difficult for me to read and then also talk to you. I get tripped up, so I'm going to go back. Programmed death occurs on many levels. Monthly, the uterine lining of menstruating women sheds as its dead cells, the menstrual blood, flow through the vagina. Each autumn, in judicious trees and shrubs of the North Temperate Zone, rows of cells at the base of each leaf stem die. Without the death of this thin layer, cued by the shortening of the day length, no leaf would fall. Using genetic engineering techniques, investigators such as my colleague at the University of Massachusetts, Professor Lawrence Swartz, can put certain death genes into, into laboratory-grown cells that are not programmed to die. The flask full of potentially immortal cells on receipt of this DNA then die so suddenly that the precipitous cessation of their metabolism can be timed to the hour. The control cells that have not received the death genes live indefinitely. Menstrual blood, the dying leaf layer, the rapid self-destruction of cells that receive the death genes, and the slower but more frightening aging of our parents and ourselves are all examples of programmed Unlike animals and plants that grow from embryos and die on schedule, all bacteria, most nucleated microscopic beings, namely the smaller protocysts and fungi such as molds and yeast, remain eternally young. These inhabitants of the microcosm grow and reproduce without any need for sexual partners. At some point in evolution, meiotic sex, the kind of sex involving genders and fertilization, can correlated with an absolute requirement for programmed death. How did death evolve in these protocyst ancestors? An elderly man may fertilize a middle-aged woman, but their child is always young. Sperm and eggs merge to form, em to form the embryo, which becomes the fetus and then the infant. Whether or not the mother is 13 or 43 years old, the newborn infant begins the newborn infant begins life equally young. Programmed death happens to a body and its cells. By contrast, the renewed life of the embryo is the escape from this predictable kind of dying. Each generation restores the status quo ante, the microbial form 
of our ancestors. By a circuitous route, partners that fuse survive, whereas those that never encounter sexual liaisons pass away. By a circuitous route, partners that fuse survive, whereas those that never enter sexual liaisons pass away. So the partners that few survive, again, it's important to point out the kind of individuality that she's referring to here, because the individual partners do not survive, but their metabolism remains contiguous, and something about their genome remains contiguous, and that is what survives. So it's self of a different order different order of self. Eventually, the ancestral microbes made germ cells that frantically sought and found each other. Fusing, they restored youth. All animals, including people, engage in meiotic sex, all descended from microbes that underwent meiosis, cell divisions that reduce by half chromosome numbers, and sex, fertilization that doubles chromosome numbers all descended from microbes that underwent meiosis. Bacteria, fungi, and even many protists were, and are, reproducing individuals that lacked sex lives, like ourselves. They must reproduce without partners, but they never die unless they are killed. The inevitability of cell death and the mortality of the body is the price certain of our protocyst ancestors paid, and we pay, sp and we pay still for the meiotic sex they lack. Surprisingly, a nutritious... Okay, introduction complete. <laughs> She's gonna move on to kefir now, um, but let's summarize what that. So she's talking about death, and what she's saying is that death as we know it was the price we paid for sex, right? Sex has this obscure evolutionary advantage of, of making the lineage more evolvable. I mean, that's a, that's a, a claim. You can, you can challenge me on that, but I think that's generally the way that I understand the evolutionary advantage of sex is that it, it increased the evolvability of the lineage, and so the lineage evolved. Um, and with that, you know, with this, this meiosis thing, haplodiploid thing that evolved as a way of of becoming more adaptable and flexible in different environments, and more, more, more able to adjust to robust change. With that evolved these bodies that died. Because in order to renew them, you have to go back to the beginning. Um, so that's interesting. You know, there's echoes of the fall here, that Adam and Eve discovered their sexuality and were cast out of the garden, right? Sex and death are linked from the start. It's a great point. Um, now we're going to move on to kefir. Cheers. Surprisingly, a nutritious and effervescent drink called kefir popular in the Caucasus Mountains of southern Russia and Georgia, informs us about death. Even more remarkably, kefir also illustrates how symbiogenesis, the appearance of new species by symbiosis, works. The word kefir applies both to the dairy drink and to the individual curds or grains that ferment the milk to make the drink. These grains, like our protocyst ancestors, evolved by symbiosis. Abe Gommel, a Canadian businessman and owner of an owner of Liberté dairy products manufactures real kefir of the Georgian Caucasus as a small part of his line of products. He and his diligent co-worker Jeanette Balkamin descend daily to the basement vat of his, vat room of his factory to inspect the heated growth of the thick milky substance on its way to becoming commercial kefir. Like all good kefir makers. They know how to transfer the most pulp and thriving pellets at, at between the, like most good kefir makers, they know to transfer the most pulp and thriving pellets at between 9 and 10 every morning, weekends included, into the freshest milk. 
Although nearly everyone who lives in Russia, Poland, or even Scandinavia drinks kefir, this champagne yogurt of the Caucasian peoples is still almost unknown in Western Europe and the Americas. Abe Gommel and Jeanette Buchemin have been able to train only two other helpers who must keep constant vigil over the two vats they are always running. Legend says the prophet Muhammad gave the original kafir pellets to the Orthodox Christian peoples in the Caucasus, Georgia, near Mount Erebus, with strict orders never to give them away. Nonetheless, secrets of preparation and the possibly life-extending Muhammad pellets have, of course, been shared. A growing kafir curd is an irregular spherical being, looking like a large curd of cottage cheese about a centimeter in diameter. Individual kafir pellets grow and metabolize milk sugars and proteins to make kafir the dairy drink. When active metabolism that assures individuality ceases, kafir curds dissolve and die without aging. Just as corn cobs in the field, active yeast in fermenting vats or fish eggs in trout hatcheries must be tended, so kefir requires care. Dead corn seeds grow no stalks, and dead yeast makes neither bread nor beer. Dead fish are not marketable, and in the same way, kefir individuals after dying are not kefir. Comparable with damp but inactive yeast or decaying trout eggs, dead kefir curds teem with a kind of life that is something other than kefir a smelly mush of irrelevant fungi and bacteria thriving and metabolizing, but no longer in integrated fashion, on corpses of once were live individuals. Like our protocyst ancestors that evolved from symbioses among bacteria, kefir individuals evolved from the living together of some 30 different microbes, at least 11 of which are known from recent studies. See Table 7-1. Would you like to hear a list of the 11 species that Lynn Margulis is convinced are in kefir grains? Let's read them. Uh, each individual is composed of, from the kingdom bacteria, Monera, Streptococcus lacus, Lactis, Lactobacillus casei, Lactobacillus brevis, Lactobacillus helveticus, Lactobacillus bulgaricus, Leuconostoc mesententrides, Acobacteria aceti, and from the kingdom fungi, you've got Cluveromyces marxianus, Trulobastora derebukeki, Canadia kefir, oh, I found it in kefir in Canada, Can, no, Candida kefir, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and at least 15 other kinds of unknown microbes. Oh, there's a lot going on in this kefir. These specific yeasts and bacteria must reproduce together by coordinated cell division that never involves fertilization or any other aspect of meiotic sex to maintain the integrity of the unusual microbial individual that is the kefir curd. Symbiogenesis led to complex individuals that die, like kefir and most protocysts, before sexuality led to organisms that had to die, like elephants and us. A kefir individual, like any other, requires behavioral and metabolic reaffirmation. So, she's saying the kefir can die because it is a higher order individual that is made up of many smaller individuals. And the higher order structure can be upset by a parasitic fungus or a parasitic bacteria and, and the kernel will dissolve and what you're left with is a, co is, is a collection of individuals eating each other, whereas the kefir itself is a symbiosis, and, and so it maintains a kind of structure. So it's a structure that can die, it doesn't have to, right? And then, but eventually that structure became so integrated and so important to the lives of the units below it that the structure itself became essential and therefore it had to die. That's a leap therefore it had to die. I can't, I can't back that leap up right now, but, it, but it's back up upon um, the evolution of death. So, a kefir individual, like any other, requires behavioral and metabolic reaffirmation. 
During the course of brewing the yogurt-like beverage, people had inadvertently bred for kefir individuals. In choosing the best starter to make the drink, villagers of the Caucasus naturally selected, which means they encouraged the growth of certain populations and stopped the growth of others. These people inadvertently turned a loose confederation of microbes into well-formed populations of much larger individuals, each capable of death. So that's crazy. So by selecting, by, by selecting the best tasting kefir, over hundreds of years, they they created a symbiosis because the bottles of milk that were most effectively fermented were the ones where the where the microbes could complement each other. Oh, you break down this sugar, and I'll break down that one. You know, we can trade products between us. Like so, you get this kind of wholeness because because it was selected for. By the way, if we're talking about death and immortality, the other thing to point out, if you didn't already know this, you could have assumed it, but this is dumpstered milk. So the whole thing came out of the trash. Um, I'll just let, let that metaphor be. Okay. Um, where were we? During the course of brewing the yogurt-like beverage, people had inadvertently bred for kefir individuals. In choosing the best starter to make the drink, villagers of the Caucasus naturally selected, which means they encouraged the growth of certain populations and stopped the growth of others. These people inadvertently turned a loose confederation of microbes into well-formed populations of much larger individuals, each capable of death. In trying to satisfy their taste buds and stomachs, kefir-drinking Georgians are unaware that they have created a new form of life. Pretty wild. The minute beings making up live kefir grains can be seen with high-powered micro microscopy. Figure 7.1. Can I show you figure 7.1? Oh, man. Okay. Let's see. Here's figure 7.1. I don't know, really, what we're looking at, but uh, it's uh, kefir. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You're on the internet. You don't need to look at figure 7.1. You can just Google kefir grain. Just Google kefir grain on the Googles, and you'll get a much better picture than that. Oh, you know, I'll just, uh, you can pause the video and, and look up a kefir grain, and, and then we can, we can keep going. All right, I assumed you've had enough time to Google kefir grain now. Um, so, the minute beings that make up kefir grains can be seen on Google or with high power microscopy. Specific bacteria and fungi inex inextricably connected by complex materials, glycoproteins, and carbohydrates of their own making, individuals bound by their own skin, so to speak. In healthy kefir, the bacterial and fungal components are organized into a curd, a covered structure that reproduces as a single entity. As one curd divides to make two, two become four, eight, 16, and so on, the reproducing kefir forms the liquid that after a week or so of growth becomes the dairy drink. If the relative quantities of its component microbes are skewed, the individual curd dies and sour mush results. Kefir microbes are entirely integrated into the new being, just as the former symbiotic bacteria that became the components of protocyst and animal cells are integrated. As they grow, kefir curds convert milk into the effervescent drink. Starter, the original caucus and kefir curds, must be properly tended. Kefir can no more be made by the right mix of chemicals or microbes than can oak trees or elephants. Scientists now know, or at least strongly suspect from DNA sequence and other studies, that the oxygen using parts of nucleated cells evolved from symbioses when certain fermenting larger microbes, thermoplasma like archaeobacteria, teamed up with smaller oxygen respiring bacteria. So that's interesting. I wonder when this essay was written. Um, yeah, because that's that's canonical now, and the way she's writing it, it sounds like it might have still been controversial, but she's talking about endosymbiotic theory. She's saying that we know that the, the oxygen part of our cells evolved from symbionts with smaller bacteria. Um, yeah, mitochondria. So she's going to go on and explain this. 
um, mitochondria, which combine oxygen with sugars and other food compounds to generate ev energy, are found almost universally in the cells of protoceased fungi, plants, and animals. We, as all mammals, inherit our mitochondria from our mother's egg. Like kefir, we, and all other organisms made of nucleated cells, from amoeba to whales, are not only individuals, we are aggregates. Individually, individuality arises from aggregation, communities whose members fuse and become bounded by materials of their own making. Just as people unconsciously selected the new kefir life form, so other beings caused evolution of new life, including our ancestors, as microbes, feeding on each other's fats, proteins, carbohydrates, and waste products, but only in completely digesting them, selected each other, and eventually coalesced. That was a sentence. <laughs> I'm going to read that sentence again. It was really long. Like kefir, we, and all other organisms made of nucleated cells, from amoebas to whales, are not only individuals, we are aggregates. Individuality arises from aggregation. Communities whose members fuse and become bounded by materials of their own making. Just as people unconsciously selected the new kefir life form, so other feet. What's this sentence? Um, just as people unconsciously selected the new kefir life form, so other beings caused evolution of new life, including our ancestors, as microbes feeding on each other's fats, proteins, carbohydrates, and waste products, but only incompletely digesting them, selecting each other, and eventually coalesced. That's a tough sentence. I'm not sure what it means. <laughs> Plants, from ancestors that selected but did not entirely digest each other as food. Plants come from ancestors that selected but did not entirely digest each other as food. Hungry ancestral swimming cells took up green photosynthetic microbes called cyanobacteria. Some resisted digestion, surviving inside larger cells and continuing to photosynthesize. With integration, green food grew as a part of a new self. The bacterium outside was now an individual... Words. Sorry, guys. Plants come from ancestors that selected but did not entirely digest each other... but did not entirely digest each other as food. Hungry ancestral swimming cells took up green photosynthetic microbes called cyanobacteria. Some cyanobacteria resisted digestion, surviving inside larger cells and continuing to photosynthesize. With integration, green food grew as part of a new cell. The bacterium outside was now an integral part inside the cell. From the partly digested cyanobacterium and a hungry translucent swimmer, a new individual, the alga, evolved. From green algal cells, protocysts came the cells of plants. Kefir is a sparkling demonstration that the integration processes by which our cells evolved still occurs. Kefir also helps us recognize how the origin of a complex new individual preceded a programmed death in the individual on an evolutionary timescale. Kefir instructs us, by its very existence, how the tastes and choices of one species, ours, influence the evolution of others, the 30 intertwined microbes that became kefir. Although kefir is a complex individual, a product of interacting aggregates of both non-nucleated bacteria and nucleated fungi, it reproduces by direct growth and division. Sex has not evolved in it, and relative to elephants and corn stalks, both of which develop from sexually produced embryos, kefir grains undergo very little development and display no meiotic sexuality. Yet, when mistreated, they die, and once dead, like any individual, never return to life as that same individual. Knowing that symbionts become new organisms illuminates individuality and death. That's, that's the critical sentence here, so let's go back and repeat it. Knowing that symbionts become new organisms illuminates individuality and death. So what she's saying is that there's something about this symbiosis thing which is going to tell us important stories about not only who we are, but why and how we die. Individuation, which evolved in the earliest protocyst in a matter similar to the way it did in Kefir, preceded meiotic sexuality. Programmed aging and death was a profound evolutionary innovation 
limited to the descendants of the sexual protists that became animals, fungi, and plants. The development of death on schedule, the first of a sexually of the sexually transmitted. <laughs> The development of death on schedule, the first of the sexually transmitted diseases, death is a sexually transmitted disease, evolved along with our peculiar form of sexuality, a process that Kafir lacks now and always has done without. The privilege of sexual fusion, the two-parent fertilization meiosis cycle of many protocysts, most fungi, and all plants and animals, is penalized by the imperative of death. Kafir, by not having evolved sex, avoids having to die by programmed death. Cool. Thanks for reading with me.